Orthopedic robotics has changed knee surgery as we know it, but conventional robotic systems do not operate with a wide selection of implants, given they are usually limited to one manufacturer. That is why Think Surgical believes what has gone before is not what should go ahead. Think Surgical enables choice. They believe that implant choice in combination with state-of-the-art technology is fundamental for surgeons, hospital systems, and patients. Think Surgical's T-Mini miniature handheld wireless robotic system has unlocked the implant from the robot. Just think of the possibilities when implant decisions are made by you, not for you. Please visit thinksurgical.com, that is T-H-I-N-K, surgical.com, to learn more about the democratization of Total Knee Robotics, led by Think Surgical. All right, we're taking another pivot here at the Ortho Show. Really excited to be able to give this episode to our listeners. We bring on one of the NBA legends, Chris Mullen, uh, to talk about his career in basketball. I really enjoyed talking to Chris. He's so humble, so down to earth. He talks about his journey and his relationships and how respectful he is of the path that he's taken uh, to get to where he is. And it was just such a joy talking to him and just some of the stories and the anecdotes that he has about the dream team of 1992 winning an Olympic gold medal in his Hall of Fame years and also um, uh, at St. John's with an amazing college career. This is a great episode. I know you're going to love it. Dr. Sigmund, hashtag follow the front. From medical media, this is The Ortho Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of The Ortho Show podcast, where everyone knows we bring you the best of the best in orthopedics. We have a terrific show today. It's a little surprise for our listeners. We're getting outside of our comfort zone, and we're going to bring in one of the greatest to ever play the game of basketball, Chris Mullen. He's an absolute legend, two-time Naismith Basketball Hall of Famer, both for his individual career as well as his time on the Dream Team. Uh, he had uh, two Olympic gold medals to throw on the old um, uh, 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 wall there as well. Storied college career at St. at uh, St. John's and an amazing NBA career as well. I could go on all day. Chris, you're one of my heroes. I watched you when I was growing up. It's such a pleasure to have you on. Dr. Sigmund, nice to see you. Nice to meet you. It's my pleasure to be with you and uh, look forward to uh, chatting. Yeah, no, it's great. You know, our connection is your son. He's actually a medical device rep for me in the operating room. So it was sort of this, this beautiful sort of combination of, uh, of how we were going to connect with you. So we're so thrilled to have you on. Look, Chris, we always start at the beginning. We love to hear the stories, like how this whole thing started. So you grew up in Brooklyn, New York, right? And so tell us about your parents, what life was like as a kid, and how this whole basketball thing came to be. Yeah, Doc, I was blessed. Came from a nice, close family. And as he said, in Brooklyn, New York, grew up in a great neighborhood, uh, all big families. Uh, we lived a block from the school that I attended, St. Thomas Aquinas, and that, that school had tremendous sports programs. And as a kid, I was the middle of five children. So I had an older sister and then uh, an older brother and two younger brothers. So I was the middle of five, and we all played sports. My, my neighborhood was Everything was based around sports. If we were playing basketball, baseball, I was on the swim team. And then when we weren't playing organized sports, we were in the street playing stickball, boxball, punch ball, roller hockey. We did everything. Everything was competition. Everything was based around sports. Two-hand touch, sewer to sewer in the street. So uh, I had a lot of uh, sports growing up, a lot of friends that, that pushed me. And, and, you know, we competed at everything. Uh, and my, my first idol was my older brother, Rod. He was a great athlete. And uh, so initially, that's all I wanted to be was try to be like him. And then so and I had great coaches as, as a youngster, which is really important. Um, stress fundamentals, teamwork, unselfish play. But really, in grade school, I had a coach. Uh, his name is Jack Alisi. And he gave me access to the gym at St. Thomas Aquinas if I did certain drill work. So it was kind of a privilege to get in there on my own, but I had to get my individual skill work done. It was the first time I really started practicing on my own and see myself um, 
get better, you know, each and every day. So that kind of got me really hooked on basketball, uh, that I could go by myself, work on my skills <clears throat> and get direct feedback, positive feedback. That I was improving. So that's what really got me hooked on basketball. And then, as you mentioned, um, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn. I went to high school in Manhattan, and then I wound up going to college in Queens. So basically, lived my my whole upbringing was New York City. Um, so, so and, when, so knows, when did, <clears throat> when, when did I mean you're six foot six? So you know, obviously, you know, growth happens at different stages. You know, mm -hmm. were you tall early? I mean, did you get a sense that that was something that was going to help the self select in basketball? No, that's a great question, Doc, and, and actually got really lucky. My, my older brother, who I mentioned, Rod, was, he was probably 6'3 in eighth grade. So when you're tall as a youngster, you're a center, right? Automatically. Exactly. You, you know, the tallest player on the court. Through my high, uh, grade school and even into my sophomore year in high school, I was still kind of small, 5'10". I was still a point guard on my JV team as a sophomore at Powell Memorial. When I went back to, in between my sophomore and junior year, so that season probably ends like in April of my sophomore year. When I came back to try out for the varsity team as a junior, now it's November, I was 6'4". So I had a big growth spurt um, for my sophomore year to junior year. But I had played uh, point guard. So I, I maintained, obviously, the vision of the court. And that, that, was, that was always a huge advantage. So now I grew. I had some good size. But I was still uh, a guard. So um, And I grew a few more inches before I went to St. John's. And then, you know, fortunately for me at St. John's, I played for Hall of Fame coach Lou Carnaseca, who had been a professional coach. He coached in the ABA. And back then, unlike now, coaches preferred having big guards because they could, uh, you know, when I grew up, we, we didn't have a three-point line. We didn't have a shot clock. So a lot of the emphasis offensively was to go, get to the free throw line. So a great, a great way to go to the free throw line is to post up your guards. So anyway, growing late, getting back to your question, was a huge advantage for me. Uh, and then just having great coaches that, that, that to me is what set apart, not only my, my development, but the way I was taught the game was to improve every day on your skills individually, and then take those skills and impact your team. So there was really no end goal, you know, cause sometimes when, you know, and you, and you know, in your profession or whatever profession you're in, if you have this end goal and you meet it, what are you, what are you doing? Like, what's your goal? So it was really about the daily journey of improving. Um, and when you do that, I think you, you really kind of, I did anyway, get lost in, in the joy and passion of that journey. And look, along the way, there's a lot of tough losses. There's some great wins. But when you're taught to just kind of, that's part of the process, I think it really uh, helps you have a longer career. Uh, it keeps you fresh mentally. Uh, so I, I always go back to the, the way I was introduced to the game, the coaches I had, um, and I'm a forever, forever grateful for, for them. Yeah. I mean, you, you had an incredibly successful career all along. I mean, you won a state high school championship. So, you know, look, it's funny, you know, orthopedic surgeons, most of us have pretty good hand-eye coordination, right? You, you think so. You're operating on someone. You want to know what's going on. You if I so. try to, if I try, exactly hope so. <laughs> if I try to go throw a basketball at it, it's a brick every time. Like I just do not have that skill set. So, you know, when, when did you sort of, you know, recognize that you had that, that really good hand-eye coordination, that shooting a basketball from a distance was something that, you know, you were going to get good at? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's funny you bring that up, uh, Scott, because my dad uh, always said he thought it was all the sports I did outside of basketball. I mentioned stickball. So we used to play stickball with the broomstick, which is really skinny, and a little Spalding ball, which to, to make contact with that is way tougher than, say, a baseball bat in a baseball. Uh, we played box ball, which was a, a game we did in the street. It's all about catching the ball, trying to, you know, short bounces, so it bounced in the box. But as a defender, you have to reach over and get it, grab it, the ball with your hand. So there was a lot of sports I did unknowingly, which was hand-eye coordination based. My dad always thought it was the, the other sports outside of basketball that, that helped me with that. Um, and you think about it, Scott, whether it be orthopedic surgeons, um, anything with hand-eye coordination or repetition, for me, was shooting. That was the, I spent a lot of time shooting the basketball. It was the routine. So what, and that, that includes form, the proper form, the proper technique. So having the right routine, the repetition, 
right? Countless and countless hours of repetition, whether it be a surgery and you do it over and over again, you study it, and then it becomes muscle memory. So how many cases you do over years and years, it gets easier, but it's, it's you know, there's no substitute for the proper routine and the repetition, and then, then you're great at it. And so the it's pretty fundamental, but the, again, getting back to having the passion and joy of doing it, because if you're not enjoying it, you're not going to spend as much time, which means you're not going to be as good at it. So finding that profession uh, and I think finding the, the, the joy in the journey and, 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 and finding the, the process of not doing well sometimes. That, that's part of it. That's part of life, right? Is dealing with that side of it uh, and using it as an experience to learn from to get better. Yeah, I mean, we, we say the same thing in, in surgery. It takes probably 10,000 reps to become a master to the point where right. you're really, you know, your brain is disengaged. Uh, pushing yourself, you know, beyond limits, talking about pushing yourself, it sounds to me like, you know, when you're in your high school days, you were looking for some of the best games in the city, right? So you had to travel a little bit. You went up to Harlem, you went up to Bronx, you went looking for for, for the best basketball players on, on the island? Yes, no question. And before I get into that, I got to say, much more important what you do to have the repetition. You know, if I miss, if we miss a basket, it's not that bad. If you miss, you know, if you're a quarter inch off on that, uh, on the scalp, yeah, it be a little, if you're a 50 little more pressure on you. <laughs> I looked at your stats, man. You know, you were a 50% three point shooter as you're, as you were getting towards the, you know, the, the, the end of your career. So you were really getting good at it. If we're shooting 50% three pointers, our patients aren't very happy with us. <laughs> yeah, a, lot, a lot more pressure on you for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but no, but there's, you know, look, being on the basketball court and in front of all those fans and things, it's a whole different, uh, different type of pressure, but still remarkable. So you can't leave New York. So you're going to find yourself a place to go to college in New York. You've grown up there. You're not going anywhere. So you find, you know, one of the iconic coaches of the of his age, Luke Karnaseka at St. John's, and uh, and you're a shooting guard. But it, like, correct me if I'm wrong. The three point line, you there wasn't there yet in college when you were playing ball. Is that right? That's right, Scott. Um, yeah. So you know, I I met Coach Karnaseka when I was in fourth grade. So it was a unique wow. situation, you know. But when he was recruiting me, it was a very unique situation because I had known him. I had gone to his basketball camp. You know, as a young kid and, uh, you know, l listen to him not only teach us, you know, fundamentals and teamwork and things like that at his camp, doing his lectures, heard him talk about the great players he had coached. So there was a unique, very unique relationship there. And when I when I was getting recruited, I wound up getting, you know, highly recruited out of high school. I visited Duke, Virginia, Villanova, Louisville. Um, but as I went on these trips, I always compared everything to St. John, what I had at home. And if there was something better and more, um, you know, fulfilling, I would look look at it. But every time I came off those trips, and I had great trips, all great coaches that I, that I visited with, I always felt much more comfortable uh, being with Coach Karnaseka and then being at home, having a having chance to play in front of my family and friends at Madison Square Garden. So that that was somewhat of an easy choice. And one of the best choices, one of the best decisions I've made in my life. Yeah, I mean, dude, you crushed it. I mean, you were Big East Player of the Year. You were sophomore, junior, and senior years, all American. Those same three years as well. And next thing you know, you know, you're you're going to the Olympics as well. So, I mean, it, you had to have been in a sweet spot, you know, uh, you know, physically, emotionally, psychologically, sort of being in that environment where you knew you were comfort, and that's where you were, and you had been living. So, obviously, it paid off. Yeah, and and Sky, it's a big fact we just said having that support system. Not not only having a great coach like Coach Karnaseka, having incredible teammates with Bill Winton, Mark Jackson, Walter. We had so many great players there, um, and then having my family. You know, having my family at the games, uh, having that support system, and and when we played those games, whether it be on campus at St. John's in Queens or really at Master Square Garden, it, it really became like a family gathering. You know, everyone everyone met at the games and we just had a blast. So those were four incredible years for myself, uh, for, for all my teammates, and then for my family and friends. It's, uh, you know, I look back, just great memories. Who was your, who was your, your most difficult competitor at that time? Some, name some of the, the amazing players that were, you were playing against at the time. Yeah, well, within the Big East, Number one was Patrick Ewing with the Georgetown, and, and Patrick was an incredible player. Um, 
both college and NBA, but Patrick's four years at Georgetown, they went to three final four. So they were dominant. Uh, Villanova uh, had a guy at Pickney who I played with and uh, against all through high school. He was at Villanova. They won the 1985 national championship. Um, North Carolina was a big team. Michael Jordan was at North Carolina at that point in time. We played them twice. Uh, he had mentioned earlier the Olympics. So Matt, Michael Jordan, Patrick, you and myself played on the 1984 Olympic team together. We all came out of high school together. So college basketball at that point in time, I was in school from 81 to 85, was actually more popular than the NBA at that time. There was several times when we played at Master Square Garden in the afternoon and we'd have 19,000 people there and the Knicks would play a night game and they'd have, you know, maybe 10,000. So at that yeah, point in time, amazing. the college... And, you know, all the players stayed three and four years. So there was really uh, organic rivalries that developed because we played against each other for so many years. Um, you know, Ralph Sampson was in, in college at that point in time. He was Just, National yeah. Player of the Year four times. He stayed in college for four years, which would never happen, you know, these days. For sure. uh, but it was, a, it was a great time to play in college basketball. We had great success, incredible um, competition. You know, think about all those teams and players. But what it really did, it was incredible preparation for the NBA. Because really, uh, when you're playing against guys for three and four years, uh, and like when I was a freshman playing against seniors, we're playing against men. So there's no better experience than that um, if you go on to play at the next level. And I thought all those players I mentioned <clears throat> went on to have incredible NBA careers because of not only the experience of playing against each other, but you get in three and four years of great coaching, you know, incredible discipline and work ethic. And to me, there's really no replacement for that um, than to go through it, experience it, and then take it with you uh, for the rest of your career. It's funny. I was uh, I did my fellowship at Curlin Job uh, in Los Angeles. So we, we would take care of the Lakers. I was there in 95, 96, so a little bit further down the road. But I'll never forget it. One of one of the, the, the team position for, for the Lakers was Steve Lombardo. And had been taking care of the the Lakers in, since the seventies, and he would joke around with us. He would be like Scott, you know, there was a time when when the doctors had nicer cars than the players. <laughs> you know? but, but that's uh, that's changed a little bit these days, that's for sure. I, I know but, Dr. Uh, Lombardo well. He he took care of me yeah. a few times at, at the forum. He stitched me up a few times, and also he was with us uh, ninety two during the Olympic uh, Dream there, Team. That's exactly right. So we'll talk about the Dream yeah, Team too, guy. but. So you have this storied college career and you're playing against, you know, some that we all know and, and love who are just great memories for us. But then you get picked in the in the first round, uh, seventh pick to go out to California. What are you going to do, dude? I mean, you got to leave New York. You're going to be OK out there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, initially, no. <laughs> it, was, it, was kind of, it was kind of a shock. Um, and we talked about it. So my, my only time really leaving New York was a few tournaments I played in high school and then the 84 Olympics, which was in Los Angeles. So my vision of California was Los Angeles beaches and, you know, good weather and things like that. Bay area is a little different, you know, from, from a climate standpoint and just a very different culture than LA. But, uh, when I came out initially, um, so that was 1985, 86 season. Again, the NBA was not what it is today. Um, there was no practice facilities. There were really no teams didn't have their, their home offices and things like that. It was, it was still very in the development mental stages. David Stern, the, the uh, commissioner at the time was still really putting his imprint on the league and making changes uh, that, that came about quickly. But when I first came in the league, the Warriors, the Clipper, those, those were the franchises that had, had really been struggling. Uh, I mentioned earlier when I was playing at St. John's, we'd have 19,000 uh, at the Garden. I think the first game I played at Elkland Coliseum, there was probably five or 6,000 people there. And initially I was like, wow, this is like kind of a downgrade from college. This is kind of weird. Like I thought this was the NBA. Over time, all that changed. Um, I did a lot of changing myself too individually, which was the most important thing. Um, but... Again, getting um, focused on the journey and the process. A lot of changes happen within the Warriors organization. Uh, ownership change, coaching change, things like that. Uh, we acquired different players 
that I that I connected with mainly Mitch Richmond and Tim Hardaway. And then, you know, pretty quickly that Oakland Coliseum was sold out. Um just part of the the history of the Warriors. You know, the Warriors like most franchises, whether it be a Celtic fan and a Laker fan, which they both have 17 banners. But but sports in general, like life, it's very cyclical. You know, you go through some great, great runs with the Warriors or in a, you know, a decade now of, of a dynasty, right? With Steph Clay and Draymond. But that that kind of changes and then how you handle it down period is important. And there's always a you know, a vehicle to get back to the top. So I was kind of on the, my, my playing days, it was like three different cycles within one. I got here was not, not, not good at all. We got pretty good. It was some bad trades. Um, so, you know, again, getting back to maintaining your, your um, mental outlook on the journey being more important than, you know, the, the day-to-day um, wins and losses. Yeah, no, that's terrific. So, so tell us about, you know, one of the things I still always think of, you know, is the dream team. So it's 1992, the Olympics are going to be in Barcelona, if I'm not mistaken. So tell us about the process of being selected to that team at that point, right? Because now you got pro athletes that are available to come on. That must have been an incredible challenge to be able to to get on that team and and, and do what you guys did. Yeah, that was, you know, one of the, one of the greatest moments of my career. Um as you said, Scott, that was the first time NBA players were eligible to participate in the Olympics. So in 1984, we had talked about that briefly. That was an old school tryout. It was 72 players invited to tryouts. We practiced three times a day for two months to make that team. So a very different process. And, and at that point in time, we all thought that was our only chance to make the Olympic team because it was for amateur players only. Um, so between... Uh, 1988, we lost uh, U.S. Uh, we were beaten by Russia and um, FIBA, USA Basketball, and the NBA all got together because international teams were already using their professional players. So to, uh, I think it was a, a lot of different reasons, but to grow the game of basketball, to level the playing field, um, FIBA, NBA, USA Basketball all got together and decided that NBA players would be eligible to play this time in 92, which was amazing and fortunate for me, which, you know, we do not have control of timing, but I was playing at a high level at that point in time. And you had mentioned there was no three-point line in shot clock when I played in college. So the one difference in the NBA and Olympic bat- and FIBA basketball, the three-point line was a big factor. 92, 1992, NBA teams were not shooting 40 and 53 point shots a game, but FIBA teams were. So shooting was a premium. Having having three point shooters was really important, which was one of the reasons I was picked. Um, that team, obviously, everyone, if you're a basketball fan, everyone knows the players on that team, legendary historical players um, of all time. And it was it was the biggest moment of my career, the proudest moment of my career. And that summer uh, was, I mean, obviously, it was a dream. It was the dream team, but it was a dream of mine to wake up every day and go to practice with Magic and Larry and, and Michael and Patrick and, you know, Clyde, you, Carl Malone, John Stockton, David Robinson. You know, the team is just legendary players, but to go to practice and enjoy the competition and the, the respect and admiration that we all have for each other. And, you know, early used to mention my son, Sean, that was probably the greatest thing was Sean was born that summer. So he was a two month old baby. And my wife and I, Liz, were trucking him all over the world. And, Although he doesn't remember, we have great pictures and fond memories of that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just a, awesome. amazing. Yeah, just great memories. Uh, great friendships were made. And from a playing standpoint, from a performance standpoint, was really cool was we all, before every game, we knew we were going to win the game. But we really had a um, conscious effort to set a high standard of team play, to really play it at the highest level we could, and not so much just the amount of the, the uh, score that we won by, but the level of play, you know, high assist, low turnovers, high, high efficiency offensively, you know, good team defense. And not only for us, but for the teams behind us, for the teams coming behind us to, to set that level, uh, set that standard so high. Um, and, and I think uh, that was accomplished. You got those gold medals sitting behind you somewhere or are they putting away in the safe somewhere? Yeah, they're put away, but 
Uh, yeah, they're in a, they're in a safe deposit box, so I don't lose them. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's uh, I mean those those names on that dream team are just unbelievable. You know, the the other teams never really had a chance, but I do love the perspective of how you you guys work together as a team, and that was important to you and the no individuals were standing out and, and did it together as a team so that's awesome so then you know so you got you you you're you come on back and then you go and play a little bit of basketball with larry bird as a coach out in indiana how was that that was awesome that was a, that was a towards the end of my career my last few years playing and uh obviously i get got to know larry played against larry quite a bit he was with my idols growing up i tried to emulate him on the court um, and then during the dream team, we spent a lot of time together, Larry and I. And then lo and behold, eight years later, or about eight, nine years later, he gets the head coaching job at the Pacers. I was coming up on a contract and um, we chatted and uh, made that move really to go play with Larry. Some of, some of the greatest teams I ever played on, you know, my three years with the Pacers, we went to two conference finals and one NBA finals. Um, so really a, just a great group of guys, veteran teams got, got reunited, with, reunited with my college teammate, Mark Jackson, Reggie Miller, Rick Smith, Antonio and Dale Davis, Jalen Rose, so just a, just a great team. Uh, you know, playing for Larry was, was a, was a blast. We had a lot of fun. The GM there was Donnie Walsh, a dear friend of mine from New York city. Great guy. So just a, just an incredible experience something I really cherish and it was great timing to end my career like that. You know, I had, had had a good career with the Warriors and they were in transition period at that time. So when Larry called, it was, it was a, you know, quick decision to go do that and really had three great years with the Pacers. Yeah. I mean, over a decade in the NBA and, and the wear and tear that puts on, you know, that hard basketball court, you know, from an early childhood all the way through eventually it has to end. You can't play forever at that level. Uh, but, you know, what an amazing career uh, that you've had on the court. And then you decide to come back home and do a little bit of coaching back at the old alma mater. Yeah, I did. Did you have some fun? Did you have some fun doing that, too? I did. It was a lot of fun. Um, we got better each and every year, which was uh, satisfying and rewarding. And uh, each and every team, obviously, is different. The personnel is different. Uh but I had a bunch of really good guys. I, I really enjoyed coaching them. And I really enjoyed the, the summer, the summer months where we had, you know, the, the, the guys could be in just maybe take a class. So there's less uh, stress on their time and really had like a, a training camp type mentality. I really loved that. So I, so I thought the guys got really good in the off season. Uh, I had a tremendous staff at St. John's. I mean, Mitch Richmond, Greg St. Jean, Drew Anthro, Bo, all these guys about five or six of those guys that worked for me now in the NBA on staff. So had an incredible coaching staff there to help me and uh, the players that we had come through at the, my four years there. We, we had a really good time. Four years was plenty. And, uh, but I had a blast, you know, we went then, from, uh, I think we had eight, 14, 16, 21 wins. So consistent improvement across the board. Uh, yeah. So it was, it was a good time. And, uh, yeah, good memories with that also. That's awesome. And then you get back on the plane, back to California, man. You're just California, back to New York, and back and forth. And and now you're – tell us about what you're doing now. I know you're you're broadcasting for, for the Golden State Warriors, and uh, you guys pulled out a win last night, so it's going to Game 7 tomorrow night. So we really appreciate that you took some time out of your schedule to yeah. come on with us. Uh, but how, how's the broadcasting gig going? It, it's awesome. I love my job now. I work for NBC Sports Bay Area. We're based in San Francisco. We, you know, flagship uh, station for the Golden State Warriors. So I do pre and post game with uh, local personality Bonte Hill. Uh, I work with Darrell Darrell Wright and Festus Azili, two former Warriors. So we have a blast, man. Um, team is obviously a great, great dy dynastic team. Last 10, 11 years with uh, Steph, Clay, and Draymond. Steve Kerr is a joy to be around. Uh, Joe Lake and his ownership group is just a first class organization. So covering the team is easy and fun. 
<laughs> you know, it, it, this is an orthopedic podcast, so we got to throw in a little bit of orthopedics. Of course. So of I course. would think, you know, for someone like yourself, you know, all of the of the time up and down, the miles and miles on that hard court, you had to have had some orthopedic stuff going on. So tell our listeners, you know, what you've had done and who did it for you and what the experience was like. Yeah. So uh, during my career, not not too bad. I've had, you know, I had the typical ankles and uh, shoulders and things like that. No surgeries, though. I have three Good. hand surgeries. I have three hand surgeries, which is kind of weird. But um, my pinky I had done twice. The, the ligament there was torn off. So I had did that twice. And I had uh, my thumb I had repaired. Um, kind of freak accidents. But throughout my career, I, I, I avoided surgeries on my knees. I had, I had some PCL and some uh, sprains. Um, back then, I thought it was pretty good advice. They always, If you could avoid surgery, avoid it. Sure. Um, so I kind of avoided all that stuff. Then when I retired, I, had, you know, towards the end of my career, I had a meniscus, but it wasn't really bothering me. I was able to play through it. Did a lot of, you know, PT and kept that um, VMO strong around the kneecap and things. There like you go. That. You got so, it. You got that anatomy yes. right. Short, short leg, short leg extension to keep it strong. So I got through my career, and when I retired, I still was playing a lot of basketball. Like I said, and, and, you know, I still love the game and had a lot of fun. I used to play pickup. So I kept playing, and that's when my knees started bothering me. So by the time I went in, I had a double meniscus, and I had my kneecap scraped with arthritis, which was a pretty long process. That, that recovery, the, the kneecap especially was sore. So that was a big, long rehab process. And then when I went back to coach at St. John's, again, still working out a lot, playing. Over time... I found myself, you know, always kind of fidgety sitting and, and trying to get comfortable. And, and then I had trouble sleeping and I didn't know what it was. I, my hamstring, my groin. Um, I went to uh, see a doctor at HSS, Dr. Sue. Quick, he, he scheduled an x-ray and an MRI. Took an x-ray and said, we don't need an MRI. You're, you're bone on bone on your hip. Um, if you do it, the sooner you do it, the better. Cause if you do it soon, I can resurface it. If, if you wait, I'll probably have to, um, replace it full replacement. So 2015, I had a, a left hip resurfacing and, uh, I mean, it's like, it's like a new life. It's amazing. So 2015, so 2023, it's still holding up good. Incredible. Incredible. So, and and you, know, is, you know what's great about it, Scott? And, and I, this is, you know, and the, the, the surgery is as important as anything, but then the maintenance and the rehab is also. So what it's really yeah. done, because no pain, I sleep better, I wake up, and I want to go work out. I want to take care of it, as opposed to laboring through the day and, and managing pain and things like that. So it's really rejuvenated my my life in so many different ways um yeah so i'm forever grateful for surgeons like you uh technology and devices that you know i i know you know if it was seven years earlier i wouldn't have the the, the longevity that i do now so it's amazing the uh the advances that the technology and medicine has make each and every year it's it's you know i'm grateful for that yeah, no, we love to give our shout outs here at the Ortho Show. So it was Dr. Ed Sue down at HSS and you had a Birmingham hip replacement, which is not one of the more common ways in which hip replacements are done and hip resurfacing. So it's really great to hear that, you know, eight, nine years in, you're still doing well. So I got to ask you, you know, we do our research here at the Ortho Show. You know, Christy Brinkley had had her hip done by Dr. Sue as well. Was she in the hospital with you at the same time or was that a different time? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but but highly recommended Dr. Sue. Uh, I know for just friends of mine, uh, Jason Kidd, Mitch Richmond, Mark Jackson, um, all, all have seen Dr. Sue and all doing well and thriving. Uh, but I was not in, in, the, in the hospital with Christy Brinkley, no. All right, good. We didn't want Billy to get all pissed off or anything like that. But no. <laughs> no, look, Chris, this was fantastic. I mean, what a, what a, you know, you're such a kind uh, soul. I love the fact that you talk about, uh, you know, your motivation, your path in life, your journey. You know, it's not just basketball, it's all of those things that sort of bring you to where you are at this moment. 
You've had an incredible basketball career, Hall of Fame basketball career. It was such a joy to watch you and participate. And uh, we really, really appreciate the fact that you took some time out of your busy schedule to be here for our Worth Show listeners. No, it's my, my pleasure, Doc. And uh, I want to thank you for sharing your experience and knowledge with my son, Sean. And thanks, Sean, for putting us together. That's what life's all about, right? Paths crossing with different ways. And um, hopefully... The Warriors can, you know, keep winning and your Celtics can pull it off. We'll have a repeat of the Celtics Warriors and we'll get together <laughs> for a bite to eat. Oh, I love that, brother. That would be fantastic. I know my kids are, would be very excited to see see you and, and also see the Celtics back in it for sure. Look, man, well, it's I'll, been be up there. I'll, I'll be up. I'll be up there to visit Sean. It doesn't have to be the NBA. I'll be up there this summer to see him when we'll get together. Well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll have a steak for sure. I'd love that very much. Really, again, appreciate your time, Chris. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro, host of the Ortho Show. Till next time.